your Bibles with me real quick, Philippians chapter 4. A little word of exhortation this morning. And uh, then let's see what God wants to do. My message, very simply, let go and let God. Let go and let God. Sometimes we sweat and we fret about a lot of things we should not be sweating and fretting about. And I've learned that if you live long enough, there will be some obstacles along the way and some hurdles that you have to overcome. In John 16, 33, Jesus put it very, very simply. He said, in this world, you will have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Have a great attitude. I have overcome the world. And I've learned in my short life of 17 years that if you have a big dream, you have a big enemy. A big God, but a big enemy. I think the enemy is not much concerned about many people because they are their own trouble. But the bigger your dream, the bigger the opposition. Amen. So how many dreamers are here this morning? How many of you believe in God for great things? So let's talk about it this morning. Let go and let God. Philippians 4 verse 4 to 7. The Bible says rejoice in the Lord always. And again I will say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is Yah. My translation. God is. Not God was not. God is. He is. Jehovah Shammah. Ik moet je weer gaan preken naar Afrikaanse dienst. Want ik wil begin Afrikaans spreken. Hij is daar. Dit is wat Jehovah Shama betekent. God is there. God is present. God is. That's what the Apostle Paul says. The Lord is at hand. No matter what you are facing. No matter what you are going through. And not always negative. Sometimes it's our challenges that create our problems. When David was anointed king. The enemy came to attack him. Because Satan will always try and stop what God has appointed and what God has anointed. So he says the Lord is at hand, or the Lord is here. Be anxious for nothing. Everybody say nothing. But in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. The message translation says, celebrate God all day, every day. I mean, revel in Him. Make it as clear as you can to all you meet that you are on their side working with them and not against them. Help them see the master is about to arrive. He could show up any minute. Don't fret or worry. Don't worry. Be happy. Would I like in a week again? A world's a lucky day. You know what? Now my generation is allowed to do. Here, young men, you don't have to worry about me. So I'm about, so it's Acts 17 is when I want to say, don't worry, be happy. And that was about the tune, right, Harry? Don't worry, be happy. Don't worry. So we all need a box like that, that, that you can push in the morning that says, don't worry. When you toss and turn in the evening and you can't fall asleep because you worry about things that you can't change in any case, you need a little voice there that says, don't worry. Because the only thing worry produces is stress. And stress accomplishes nothing good. Doctors will tell you that stress is at an all-time high. And stress is one of the leading causes of major disease and death in human beings today. Because people worry, 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 worry. Worry about things they can't change. Worry about things that they cannot control. And especially if you have a, a controlling personality. I sat on the airport as I fly backwards and forwards all the time, like many of you, I meet you on the airplane. And it's always a great privilege when many of our beautiful people come. Beautiful girl that sat there uh, in the bus looking at me and she said, Pastor, I go to CRC, you are my father. So I said, what a great honor to meet you. I always love to talk to CRC members wherever we go. Amen. We have the best people in the world. Say amen and give Jesus praise for the house of God and for the great people that we have in the house of God. Amen. So we had, like many of you know, planes get delayed. And initially I wanted to start fretting and stressing. And I thought, why worry? I'm going to change it in any case. And the plane was there. The passengers were there. The crew was there. But there was no pilot scheduled. Oops. How will the plane take off without the pilot? At least I had good company. Opal Abua, one of my great friends, met him. And we sat having a great time on the airport talking about how God blessed his business, how God is blessing the ministry, the great things that are ahead. And I just realized through something like that, you can sit there and stress or you can make the best of a bad situation. 
Pretoria, sitting in that traffic, dropping my daughter when I'm there every second week. At school, sometimes traffic, traffic, traffic. And I watch people sweat and stress and trying to uh, cut in front of this person, then cut in front of that person. And actually, I stop at the same robot and they one or two cars ahead of me. And I think, was that really necessary? And sometimes I see myself in those people driving fanatically to get to a destination. Remember when my children were very small, we used to go on a holiday. We still do. It's not a novelty because I believe parents have to create memories. And uh, I would always tell them, get in the car. In six hours, we're in Durban. And then I would drive against the clock, putting myself under pressure because I wanted to get there at 12 o'clock, not 1 o'clock. And eventually the kids would sit there and say, Daddy, 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 we, we need to go. We, Daddy, Daddy, we need to go. We need to go, Daddy. <clears throat> and I would say, okay, I'll stop at the next, uh, uh, next uh, filling station. Actually, I wasn't, uh, wasn't very good. I repent since then. And uh, then as they see the filling station, they get all excited. I look at my time and I think, I, I, I have to move on. And when we, we, we stopped at the garage, I would say, okay, you've got three minutes, then I'm leaving. Three minutes, run. Stressing about things we don't have to stress. Fretting about things we don't have to fret. Being anxious about things that we should not be anxious about. And very often, the things that cause the stress in our lives are the natural things, like paying bills. How many of you know what it is to pay bills? You have to pay school bills, you have to buy food, you have to buy clothes, you have to pay the rent, you have to pay your staff. And very often those are the things we fret about, the daily things, the cares in life. We think about these things. When we build buildings like this, a 30 million rand project here in Bloemfontein and we have 8 million rand in the bank and we're building a 120 million rand project and we need 50 million rand in the next six months in Pretoria and we have like 8 million in the bank account there. It's very easy to start stressing and to start thinking, but, but, but that person said he's going to do this and he's not going to do this and, and you start fretting and sweating and if you see again, you can lose your peace and your joy. And then this journey that God called you to live is no longer a joyful journey. Remember what Jesus said, my yoke is easy, my burden is light. God doesn't want you stressed out. God doesn't want you dying of a heart attack at a young age. Sure challenges will be there. And if you have big vision, we'll talk about it. You have to live and walk by faith. But God wants you to have enjoyment. Amen. He writes in the book of Ecclesiastes, he says, enjoy the wife of your youth whom you love, whom you love all the days of your life. So God wants you happily married. God wants you to have fun with your children. God wants you to have a smile on your face. God wants you to live a stressed-free life if that is possible. Say amen this morning. Amen. So he says, don't fret or worry. Instead of worrying, pray. Let petitions and praise shape your worries into prayers, letting God know your concerns. What is he saying? Rather than worrying, talk to God. Because God always hears and God listens to your requests. In Matthew 6, Jesus addresses the very subject from verse 28. He says, So why do you worry about your clothes? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They neither toil nor spill. And yet I say to you that Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Now if God so clothes the grass of the field, which today is, and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore do not worry, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, what shall we wear, for after these things the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows. God knows this morning, and he has the good thing, God cares. God is a personal God. God knows the bill you have to pay. God knows that you have to pay school fees. God knows that your children are growing, and if you're a parent, as they get older, they get more expensive. Amen. You have to change their clothes every week. They're not like the Israelites who had the same clothes for 40 years or every year. And sometimes they grow so quickly, boys especially, that in six months you have to change the whole cupboard. Want to eat, 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 eat. Alles anders is rispers. Alles vreet. Alles eet nie. Alles so dier alle tiende jare gaan. Jou vrou kom daar aan met groceries, sikke sakke, groceries. En dan as jy morgen die pa gaan kyk vir kos, is die kos weg. Want daar staan die seen voor hy vrieskas en hy eet, 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 soos hy rispers, het jy al gesien, en sy vir hem. And you can literally hear your son growing. They never go to the toilet, that's what amazes me. It's like they just stockpile everything everywhere. 
In verse 34, he says, Therefore, do not worry about your life, for tomorrow will worry about its own. Listen to me this morning. God still has your future in the palm of his hand. Jeremiah 29, 11, one of my favorite scriptures, he says, I know the thoughts I have for you, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. What is he saying? You can have an expected end. You can know that your father is in control. The next verse says, then you will call upon me and you will pray to me and I will listen to you. 1 Corinthians 2 verse 9 and 10, he says, I has not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things God has prepared for those who love him. Now, if, God lo- if you love God, God has a great future for you. If you don't love God, God has a great future for you. Amen. And in this journey of life, no matter what we face, we need to always remember all things work together for good. To them who love God, to those who are called according to his purpose. The good, the bad, and the ugly. The times we can control and the times we cannot control. And especially in those times when things seem unclear or uncertain. When we cannot control certain things. We have to learn how to let go and let God. Because sometimes the best thing you can do is to take a step back. The best thing you can do is to rest in the Lord. In Hebrews, the Bible says there remains a rest for the people of God. The end of faith is to rest, knowing, believing, having the total assurance that God is in control. Even when things seem to be out of control, you have to believe that God is in control. When things do not make sense, you have to believe that God is working behind the scenes as your master deliverer. He is the orchestrator of your deliverance. He is the orchestrator of your vision. He knows exactly how to get you from the prison to the palace. Palace, if you believe that this morning, say amen and give God a hand clap of praise. Hallelujah. Come on. So no matter who you are, no matter where you are, God will be there every step of the way. Remember Job, when he went through his calamity, in one day all hell literally broke, broke loose in his life. His wife stood looking at him and said, well, why don't you just give up? Why don't you just curse God and die? But Job fell on the ground. He never gave up on his God. He believed in the mercy and in the favor of God. And he said this as he was lying in the presence of God. Though he smite me, yet will I trust him. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And that's what we have to do in difficult times. That's what we have to do when we don't understand the journey. When we don't understand what is happening. When you go through betrayal. When you go through abandonment. When you go through the unexpected. When storms in life come against you. That's the time not to curse. That's the time not to quit. But that's the time to fall on the ground and to look up. And to say, blessed be the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. I will trust Him. I will trust Him. And to give control over to God. Let me tell you something this morning. God is more in control of your life than you will ever give Him credit. Hindsight is perfect sight. Many times I thought, where is God? And then in the nick of time, God comes through. God always comes through. Because He cannot deny Himself. He's faithful. God will always vindicate the righteous. God will never allow you to be placed in a position or a place of shame. It doesn't matter what the enemy plots or schemes against you. God is bigger. God is greater. And God is always a million steps ahead of the enemy. Are you listening to me this morning? I don't care how bleak your situation may seem. How dark your situation may seem. How impossible your vision may seem. God is always ten steps ahead of the enemy. And your God does not sleep. He knows how. He knows how to get you through that situation. He knows how to get you from the valley back to the mountaintop. He knows exactly how. In Isaiah chapter 59 verse 19, the second part, the Bible says, When the enemy comes in like a flood, the Spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against him. You may feel alone, but you are never alone. It doesn't matter who comes against you. God's got your back. God is standing with you. God is your defense. God is your shield. God is your deliverer. God will vindicate you. God will bless you. And what God has blessed cannot be cursed. Oh, come on, somebody. I'm preaching better than some of you are saying amen this morning. Hallelujah. Isaiah 54, 17, he says, No weapon formed against you shall prosper. Never said no weapon will be formed against you. It says every weapon formed against you will not prosper. That fire will not touch you. That water will not overflow you. That gates of hell will not harm you. That lack will not destroy your business. That sickness in your body will not have the final say. That divorce will not destroy your business. That lack, that famine will not have the final say. That rebellion in your son's heart will not have the final say. God will have the final say. Somebody shout amen in this place. 
because he promises beautiful ashes. He promises the oil of joy instead of mourning. The garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. Psalm 30 verse 5, he says, weeping endures for a moment, but joy cometh in the morning. I'm here to tell you that God is faithful. I'm here to tell you that God will bring deliverance, that God will make the way where there seems to be no way. I don't care how long the delay has been. Delay does not imply denial. It may just be a little detour. But he's there every step of the way. Amen. I mean, we've had bills to pay. Let me tell you something. I mean, November, church uh, project in Pretoria. I mean, we had no money in the bank. And many people thought we have to stop the project. But God said to me, I will provide. So my brother came to me and said, I'll, I'll stand surety for a certain amount. I said, no, God said we'll do this cash. He said, but in any case, a businessman down from George, who's sitting there possibly this morning, said, Pastor, I get a facility. I can feel 9 million rand leen. And when the geld terugkom, sal ek het betaal. He said, nee, God said. And now the amazing thing about God is, God very often uses the most unlikely people. Because sometimes we pray and we think God's going to do it this way. Well, we turn to man and we look to man who makes promises, who don't keep them. And then God comes and he brings the raven, he brings the crow, he brings the widow, he brings the outcast, he brings the downtrodden. Because if it's God's cause, God will always provide. Say amen this morning. I'm talking about your business as well. A businessman I sat with the other day said, Pastor, you know these big projects we do as a church gives me hope. He says, because if God can do it for the church, I know God will do it in my business. And he will. Because everything flows from his kingdom. Amen. Amen. So how do we let go and let God? Something that's difficult. Let's be honest. Easy to talk about it. Not so easy to do it. I find it difficult sometimes. Because my mind's busy, 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 busy. Sometimes 2 o'clock in the morning, busy. 3 o'clock in the morning, busy. I'm trying to help God. <laughs> you know, I pray and then I'm, I'm not saying we don't, shouldn't think. And I'm not saying we shouldn't be wise. But there remains a rest. Where you know, no matter how things seem in the natural, God is in control. When things seem to be out of control, you have a perfect peace that surpasses all understanding. When things don't make sense, you just know. Nothing beats knowing. Knowing on the inside. Amen. So how to let go? Number one, pray. Sometimes people think about praying and they think they're actually praying. No, you have to pray. You have to do what? You have to pray. People come and they say, Lord, then Lord knows my needs. No, the Lord says you have to ask. James 4 verse 2. You have not because you ask not. Prayer is a gift that God gave you. Prayer is a weapon. That the enemy cannot interfere with. Prayer is your connection to God. It's that red telephone hotline. When you pick up that phone, God is on the other side. Jeremiah 33 verse 3. The prophet says, call upon me and I will answer you. And show you great and mighty things that you do not know. A lot of things I don't know. A lot of things I speculate about. But you know when you pray, like I was standing there worshipping and God spoke to me about somebody on that side, under the anointing, you just know certain things. God shows you certain things. When you spend time with God, it's like the light goes on, you just know. Or when you don't know, you get peace. You just know it's going to be okay. Even in the natural, if it seems it's not going to be okay, you know it's going to be okay. Because you've got peace. And you know God's working. I remember when David was small. When he was born, he had club feet. I mean, his feet were turned in like this. I've shared this many times, but it's my testimony, so I may share it. Amen. <laughs> and people were concerned. Couldn't put little shoes on him or anything. He, could, he was late walking. His feet were turned. His feet were turned. Feet. Great English. So footer. His feet were turned this way and inside like this, like this. So doctors wanted to put him. Well, he obviously had to go for operation. Then put his feet in those. Cost. I said, no, this son of mine is going to walk. Was I concerned as a parent? Obviously. But I took those little feet every day in my life. Every day. 
I put his feet, took his feet in my hands. Every day, not some days, every day. I said, Father, you promised me a son, a whole son. You don't give me half a son. You don't do half a job. I ask you to heal these legs, oh God. I ask you to straighten out these legs. And I ask God, I petition God, because that's what you can do through prayer. You can state your case. You can petition God. You can talk to God about your situation. Not complain, you talk. And from that day, I took those feet every day and I spoke the word of God because you live by the power of confession. Every day of my life, I said, David, you will walk. David, you will be normal. David, you will be a sportsman. David, you will this. David, that, that, that. It took two years, not instantly, two years for his legs first to straighten out like this and then for his feet to drop. And then he finally had to go for an operation on the back to, 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 so he, because he was walking on his toes like this all the time. So I always tell people, God uses miracles and doctors. Because sometimes when, when people want a miracle, they think God is against doctors. M not in your life. When I burst a disc in my back, I went to a doctor and he, the one doctor immediately said, we have to operate on you immediately or you're going to get a drop foot. Phoned a surgeon in the church. I said, what must I do? Because you seek wisdom. Don't want to go walk around and drag my feet along. He said, pastor has a chance to rehabilitate conservative. Go here in Jerusalem. So I went. And for three months, I did exactly what the doctor told me. Went for physiotherapy every day of my life. Strengthened what I had to strengthen. After three months, I went back and he looked at the scan. He said, Sy woord in Afrikaans was ongelooflik. Was it a miracle? The miracle of medicine and the miracle of God's presence. The miracle of wisdom. The miracle to seek God and to seek a path of wisdom. So if you're in financial debt, you can't just be stupid. You have to go talk to somebody. Get wisdom. Get advice. Seek wisdom from God. Sometimes wisdom, God says, take your child to the doctor. Well, in Jesus' name. Well, if the temperature is still high, take the child to the doctor. Listen. A lot of our people think when we talk about miracles, we discount wisdom and common sense. In the area of money, all of my subject, reality is if your outflow exceeds your income, your upkeep becomes your downfall. All you need is to budget. Then pray within your budget. So I have to say that because people think they can do anything, make any foolish decision, and then pray and God just brings a magic wand. When I struggled with burnout, I was only 34 years old, man. But, I mean, I never switched off. Got up 5 o'clock in the morning, prayed 3 hours, slept 12 o'clock at night. Lived on Coca-Cola and bread. Never understood I'm a three-part being, spirit, soul, and body. So all I did was take care of my spirit. Then my spirit became so overactive, my mind couldn't switch off. So eventually all my systems in my body seemed to want to collapse. And I went from doctor to doctor until I eventually got to a very wise Professor who said to me, that's next fault with Joni. Your problem is your personalikheid. Jy is te intense. I'm still struggling with that one. <laughs> said you have to change certain things. So he said, what do you do? I say, play tennis. He says, do you compete? I said, of course. What fun is in not winning? So you put yourself under stress. I mean, that's how we used to play tennis. I mean, and that, no wonder some of my pastors resigned because I didn't try and get the ball past them. I tried to hit them with the ball. You understand? It's like <laughs> clean stuff because we can't do this anymore. So we hit you with a soft ball. But I had to change certain things. I had to realize certain things. I had to learn. So I started gardening. Me. <laughs> Laugh at me. Because that's what some of you have to do. You're so boring and so bland and so beige. And I mean, you just such an old drag. Or what, if that's a good word, I don't know. Edit it if it's a bad word, please. I don't. Apology. I've learned that God works all the time. Sometimes we think if we pray more, 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 and I say this specifically, that we're going to get God listening more. And we jump, 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 jump. I watch people sometimes, they're praying, 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 praying. And I can see there's no connection there. 
Jesus said, our father and God was there. You have a relationship with God because of Jesus Christ. You don't have to fret and sweat. When you say, our father, God listens. That's what David said in Psalm 116 verse 2. I love the Lord because he heard the voice of my supplication. Because he inclined his ear upon me, therefore will I call upon him as long as I live. I love the Lord because he heard the voice of my supplication. I'm here to tell you, you may be a mother, you may be abandoned, you may be divorced, you may go be going through the valley of the shadow of death you're not alone God is with you God is there all you have to do is pray about your problem pray about your situation cast your cares upon Jesus and that is what we have through prayer through prayer we come to God through prayer we can talk to God that's what Peter, uh, uh, Paul said be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known unto God talk to God about your situation take your cares and your burdens the bible says in 1 peter chapter 5 take those cares that you carry your name isn't hercules take those cares the weight of the world that was placed upon the shoulders of jesus christ take those cares to the cross of jesus christ 1 peter 5 or 7 the bible says casting all your cares upon him because he cares for you the amplified bible says casting all of your care upon him once and for all because he cares for you in psalm 55 verse 22 the bible says Roll your burdens upon the Lord and He will sustain you. We need to leave our cares, our wants, our needs, our desires at the foot of the cross and live this journey that God called us no matter what it is, whether it's a child, a marriage, your mind, your body, your finances, whatever it is, cast your cares upon Him. Come on, somebody shout Amen. There in Pretoria, Johannesburg. Come on, give Him praise better than that in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. You have a hotline to heaven. You can talk to God. In James chapter 5, he says, is any one of you suffering? Let him pray. Sometimes people think God is a God who doesn't answer prayer. He says pray because he listens. You don't need to be an apostle, a bishop. God listens to you as much as he listens to the pastor. Maybe you're just murmuring more. You pray and then you go fetch those cares and you go take your depression back and you go live that week with your depression again. And uh, uh, Andre, I just want to tell you about my depression. Come here, buddy. Come here. Come here. Let me pass my burden to you and steal your joy as well. Uh, just, uh, you know, my depression, just stand there. And I, I want to tell you, I have a pain in my back as well. Uh, you know, let me just talk about my pain, my pain and, uh, you know, my, my, my what? My lack, my lack. Uh, my lack, you know, giving in the church, give, give, give. All they talk about is giving in this church, but we're trying to get money to you. But your poverty's mindset is keeping you from God's economy because you just eat, eat, eat. Yes, was like, firm, I whisper, you will not eat, eat, eat. God's trying to get things to you, but your mind is stopping you because you are so consumed with your cares and your worries and your concerns that you never enjoy a church service. You never enjoy praise and worship. You never enjoy a prayer meeting. You always sit there, <laughs> Everything is negative in your life. Everything is critical in your life because you live so burdened. Man, take a chill pull. Take the gospel. Get a, give your smile, a, uh, your face a smile, man. Enjoy the life that God gave you. Come on. That's what Jesus said. I've come that you may have life and have it more abundantly. I've come that you may have life and that you may enjoy it fully in Jesus' name. I've come to set you free. I've come to give you a better life. Not weighed under the cares and the trouble of the world. But that's what we do. We cast our cares upon Jesus, then we go fetch them again. And we walk with them during the week. And then Sunday when city does like today, releases the anointing, we think, yes, it's a good idea. Yeah, Jesus. And then as we leave, we take them again. The Bible says, cast your cares upon the Lord once and for all. Leave your cares at the foot of the cross. Amen. Stop worrying. Be happy. Say amen. And shout hallelujah in the place. Donkey. Number two, believe in an expected outcome. Believe that God will have the final say. Say amen. amen. It's not a good suggestion. It's reality. When Job went through his calamity and his crisis, he trusted in God's favor. David did exactly the same. He said, surely goodness and mercy will follow me. Even when I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, goodness and mercy will have the final say. James 5 verse 11, the Bible says, we count them blessed to persevere. You have heard of the endurance of Job. And seen the end intended by the Lord. That God is very merciful and compassionate. 
God restored his losses. God blessed Job. And God will bless you as well. You have to persevere. You have to believe in an expected outcome. Because this is a faith journey. We walk by faith and not by sight. We don't look at our problems. We look at the promises of God. We don't talk about our problems. We talk about the promises of God. Goodness and mercy will follow me all the days of my life. We may not understand, but we can know God is in control. Amen. In 2 Corinthians 4 verse 8 to 9, the Apostle Paul says, We may be surrounded and battered by trouble, but we are not demoralized. How's your spirit this morning? Well, I'm, I'm just... He says we're not demoralized. You watch how people lose their bounce in their step. Because every day they are faced with their challenges. Paul says, I'm going to read it again. We are surrounded and battered by trouble. But we are not demoralized. Because when you get demoralized, you will not fight the fight of faith. So you have to pray in faith. Without faith, you do not please God. God doesn't come because your name is Yanni and your name is Yanni. Jammer sikkel nie. Dis nie kom God jou gebede verhoor nie. God verhoor jou gebede want jy bid in geloof. Jy het een verwachting. Het jy een verwachting vanochtend? Wat is jou verwachting? Neutraal is ook een verwachting. Dis geen verwachting nie. O, ek het gebede het gaan oor my kom. Nee, ek het gebede het gaan my werk verloor. Well then you're not disappointed are you? When you lose your job. I knew I'm never going to get married. Well, so, are you married? No, exactly. <laughs> I knew I wasn't going to get the promotion. Did you get it? No. So, you're not disappointed. I knew my dad would say no when my kids do that to me and I say no. And they say, Dad, I knew. I said, exactly. Exactly. Because we have, when you have an expectation, you ask differently. But if you come with this apology, well, Daddy, you know, I'm, you know me, 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 me. I don't even listen when they talk to me like that. I don't think God does either when you come there with an apologetic attitude. So I always tell them. One of them wanted to go somewhere. I said, no. She said, I knew you would say no. It's not Angelique, so it's who? Like, why dad? I say, because I'm the dad. <laughs> I knew. That's exactly. I never disappoint. <laughs> hey man, what's your expectation? We are not demoralized. That's what Paul says. I'm not demoralized. When you talk to people, you can see whether they deflated or inflated. Yeah. I'm not talking about ego, I'm talking about faith. So this is Paul. Who wrote about faith? People go through trials and tribulation. They think, what have I done wrong? Nothing. Yeah. You're just living. Surrounded and battered by trouble. But I'm not demoralized. Say it. I'm not demoralized. Say it. I'm not demoralized. Say it again. I'm not demoralized. So Job was on the ground, but he was not demoralized. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. You can be knocked down, but you can still be standing up on the inside in faith. Hallelujah. Come on, somebody. <laughs> then number three, closing, you have to rest in God's timing. The amazing thing about young people is they want to grow up overnight. The little girl, two years old, and Chanel did that as well. If we looked for her, she would be somewhere with Noretta's makeup. One year old, and she would not only paint her face, but the curtains in the vicinity and the carpets in the vicinity. And we had these light carpets. Everywhere was a red patch that you couldn't get away from. If she was gone, she was her mommy. She wanted to be grown up. But how many of you know that a two-year-old girl is not grown up? In their mind, they're grown up. Sometimes we think we're ready for things and we're not. We want the vision now. God knows we don't have the character. We want now. Now. I don't have time to go study. Well, why not? Uh, you, you know, I want to start a business. Uh, you, you mean, uh, you want to start a business without a qualification? 
I don't have time. I love sometimes when people say, they just get out of school. I want to get married. Then they're 19 years old. Because Jesus is coming back. I say, hey girl, this one is 22 turning now. David 21, I look at them and, and I don't see them small, but they're my kids, man. They'll always be my kids. That's not some revelation. But I'm saying, sometimes we think we're bigger than we are. Listen. And life is a way to refine you, to purify your motive, to build you. Tribulation has a way to produce character that will keep you when you go to the mountaintop. Life, and it's the same for everybody, is filled with challenges. I'm not negative, I'm telling you fact. There's no easy. There's not a person sitting here or in Pretoria or Johannesburg or George that doesn't have a battle. So the Christianese doesn't go for me. How are you? I'm blessed, blessed. Ooh, I'm blessed, 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 blessed. I'm blessed. Hallelujah. I'm not a care in the world till you get in your car. And you can't even get off the church parking lot without driving over one of our ushers. <laughs> I'm blessed, I'm blessed, I'm blessed till somebody rubs you up the wrong way. And you want a huge company and you want people to work for you, but you've not developed any people skills? It doesn't work like that. There's a time. I mean, the doctor's sitting here, no matter how much you wanted to be a doctor, no matter how much you wanted to perform heart surgery, you don't come out of school and read three books and say, I'm going to be a doctor and then advertise. I'm the latest surgeon, 19 years old. Heart operation. How many of you will go there? No. But, but, but we get confused. Because sometimes we, 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 we misunderstand. When the dream comes, there's a journey to the palace. And it's the journey we don't want to talk about. It's the journey of frustration. The journey of test. The journey of character development that we don't want to hear about. We just want to shout fall over and tomorrow everything has to be a perfect world. And it's not like that. If you live long enough and you accomplish something. A lot of people who live a long time accomplish nothing who don't understand this. I don't say disrespectfully, I say it factually. And they talk the biggest. If God's going to get you to any place of significance, there will be a journey. And the higher God means for you to take, the tougher and the longer the journey will be. Suck it up. And I'll talk, 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 talk. I'm going to, I'm, 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 no, go clean the toilet. Just shut up and clean the toilet. Just go clean the toilets. Go sweep the pavements. Get off your little high horse. Because your theory has not been tested. Now a doctor after many years of study, then another four or five years of study as a specialist and being an apprentice, now he learns something. And now he has to perform his first open heart surgery. Now he sees if he knows. And if that first patient dies, he ain't getting more patients. <laughs> right. I think in my own life, a good thing about being over 17 <laughs> is that you learn certain things with age. And I don't mean you don't learn, because David says, and I want to say this to all our young people across the country, David says, through your precepts you've made me wiser than my teachers. So wisdom comes from God. Experience? No. Experience comes by living life. By raising children to serve God. By having a marriage. By living for God on fire after 30 years still on fire. Because anybody can blow up and blow out. Anybody can talk about what they're going to do. But then start the journey. And that's maybe what Joseph never understood. And what I never understood. And where I created most of my own pressure in my early years. In Lady Brand. 
I wanted everything now. I would pray three hours, five hours a day. And then Sunday there would be 23 people. And then Monday I would want to resign. Every Monday. Discouragement test. Have you had it? You don't write it once. You write it many times till you pass it. I want to quit. I've had it. I want to quit. I want to quit. I want to quit. And the only one that actually gives anything is you. Because if you quit, God just replaces you. Shame. You know, all our people complaining about their salaries in this country. There's 30% unemployed. Maybe you should be thankful that you have a job in Africa and that you have a job in South Africa. And that's one of the diseases in our nation, the disease of entitlement. Oh, you're very quiet here now. Well, 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 the country owes me a job. Well, 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 well the government owes me a job. Well, 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 somebody must give me a house. Well, some... Where's your, where's your expectation? Where's your faith? Where's your belief? Where's your servant heart? I'll talk about it in the next service. More relevant, maybe. Get some people mad and some liberated. Because if we don't like it, we're going to strike. What would have happened if Joseph went on a strike? Well, God, you gave me this vision. Now I'm in prison. I've had it, God. With you, with Pharaoh, with everything, I've had it. No, he was humble. He was a servant. He stayed true to the journey. And it wasn't the journey he would have chosen. But the Bible says there was a man sent by God as a slave, Nohal. Betrayed by his brothers, sold into slavery, and God was behind it. So you think the way up is, I need the promotion when I'm 23, I need to be in the director's room. And sometimes the promotion will be, you go from there to there. And God's working in you, character, testing you, proving you, watching how you will behave in the prison, whether you're ready for the palace, whether you're ready, whether you're ready, because God will not do something prematurely. People do, God won't. Because the doctors will tell you as well, if a baby is born before a certain time, there's no chance for life. And then at a certain times, prematurely, they have to fight to keep that baby alive. And then there's the challenge of certain things not developing in that body's that, that child's system. Like many Christians who prematurely get themselves where God never meant for them to be. So their lungs are not developed. Their heart is not developed. Their kidneys are not developed. Their character is not developed. They mean. They're self-righteous. They're critical. they judgmental. They have no mercy on people. Because all it's about is me, myself, and I. Interesting thing about prayer, let me just say. Jesus never taught you to pray just for yourself. I have to throw it in there. My Father, who art in heaven, give me my bread. Bless my business. What did Jesus say? Our. It's always in a context context of the local church always in the context of the body of Christ you cannot be blessed and leave, leave your brother not blessed there is affirmative action in the Bible but you will not multiply wealth by dividing wealth think about it you will not Multiply wealth by distributing it. You will diminish it. No need a rocket scientist. Go study other countries. Singapore, Indonesia, uh, Brazil. Go study countries that have turned a negative economy positively. Very quiet here. I'm just waiting for that building finished in Pretoria. And not arrogantly, but we need to say it as it is from God's word to liberate people. Amen. Come on, if you love Jesus and you forget that you're black or white, shout amen and give him praise. Hallelujah. As the black man's hour, uh, the black uh, what consciousness movement. Uh, oh, I'm black. Oh, 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 I'm black. I'm black. Hallelujah. I'm black. I'm black. I'm black. I'm black. And I know it. I'm black. 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 Jack. Black. Black. I'm black. Oh, I'm black. I'm white, I'm white, I'm white. Uh, <laughs> I ain't seen a black man in my life. I 
Man, I never ever seen a white man. Those shoes are black. My shirt is white. All I see is a bunch of colored people. That's all I see. As a matter of fact, God doesn't even see that. You know, if you say, God, I'm black, God says, huh, that's news to me. I, ain't, I never saw you. All I see is a spirit in there. I just see a spirit. I look on the heart. I don't care what color. In other words, if I, if I get excited and I get red, red, a little bit darker, uh, have I got more favor now? Please, man, get over yourself. Please. Please. As a blief toch, man. Ja, maar alles anders als ons. Wie is alle? Alle wie? Alle. Nou, hoe bid je nou? Onze vader. Nou, wie is nou naar onze vader? Onze vader. Nee, 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 alle wat nie, want alles nie soos ons nie, alles anders. So, wie is nou ons? Onze vader, wat in die jimmel is. Onze vader. Onze vader. Onze vader. Wie is die ons? Nee, ek wil nie in die kerk wees waar daar swart mens is nie. Wel, dan gaan jy nie met die jimmel gemakkelijk wees nie. Wat gaan jy daar onder doen? Huh? Hello? Yeah, I'll sit in your shock today. It's good. <laughs> Play these games in one God's favor. I mean, I hear somebody say, I, I don't like the praise and worship when she leads because she's black. Oh, really now? So what must we do? We must now ask God, God, where's the anointing? Just to, to give us, well, if we don't listen to me, he's a white pastor. Really? Bye. There's the door. Bye. Bye. What do you think? The church is about the anointing. The anointing. God's presence. And God puts his presence in people you think he shouldn't. So get over yourself. Just do the whole world a favor. Get over yourself. Get over all your opinions. Ek, sinoni, and akin, akin, me and I, and just please, just do us all a favor. We don't want to hear you. We don't want to hear you. I don't see an eye. We don't want to hear nothing about your eye. Nothing. Zero. Zip. Do us a favor. Just change your vocabulary to our, our God, our church, our vision, our country, our future. Let's change who we were out there in the natural to be the people that God called us to be. Come on. Even if you're offended this morning, you know I'm saying the truth. Hallelujah. So number three, rest in God's timing. Ecclesiastes 3 verse 1, the Bible says, To everything there is a season, a time for every purpose under heaven. A time. When you're 13, it's not time to get married. When you're 16 and you think you're in love, you can't even spell love. <laughs> oh, I'm in love. Oh, oh, please, you learn about love after years of marriage. How many of you say, Whoa, amen, whatever? <laughs> I'm sitting looking at me like this. At least, please. You learn about commitment after 20 years of serving Jesus. So whether you will still be here when you're 40, we'll see. Not the first girl comes along and you're gone. El Flaco. El shallow -o. Yeah, I'm not my You know. There's a time to be born and there's a time to die. No matter how many liposuctions you go for, plastic surgery you go for anti-aging tablets you take, you're going to die. <laughs> Amen. They can keep you together, but we can all see in the neck that you're not 40 years old. The neck tells us, and the hands tell us, you're actually 80. Just. There's a time to hear, I drop down verse 7 because I have to close, time is up, a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. It's a time to be quiet. Amen, wives. <laughs> I mean, so, I said there's a time to be quiet. I, I'm giving the brothers a go all the time. I said, amen, wives. Look at that now. It's a time to be quiet. 
Because sometimes we cause our own problems because we just want to give a piece of your mind. I'm just going to tell you what nobody else is willing to tell you now. Let me tell you now. I'm going to tell you what I want to tell you now for the last five years. I'm going to tell you. I'm going to tell you. Ugh, my nose was bang. You know, people don't build statutes for critics. <laughs> when, 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 when Peter was bothering about John, his destiny, Jesus said, I'm not, don't worry about John, just you follow me. You get busy with your life. And when you're busy, you don't even think about other people. You're busy. So there's a time to love, there's a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. To plunder hell and populate heaven. What profit is the worker from that in which he labors? I've seen the God-given task with which the sons of men are to be occupied. He has made everything beautiful in its time. Everybody say in its time. Say it again. Say in its time. Also, he has put eternity in their hearts, except no one can find out the work of God that God does from beginning to the end. So, the will of God is blessed already. The journey is what qualifies you or disqualifies you. Psalm 105, verse 17 to 21, he sent a man before them, Joseph, who was sold as a slave. Think about that. Sold as a slave. You want the promotion, you get demoted. And God was in it. Why? Because God saw what the father never saw. God saw what had to be built in the boy's character. So that when he stood in his destiny, he would not implode like so many people. Pray. Believe in God's expected outcome for your life. And rest in God's timing. How? Let go and let God. I don't know God, but I trust you. I trust you. The greatest prayer that can come out of your mouth is I trust you. There remains a rest for the people of God. God is more in control of your life than you'll ever give him credit, my brother and my sister. God loves you more than you will ever understand. God is more committed to you than you will ever understand. And I know for some of you, you've had a tough journey. For some of you, you've gone through highs and lows. And for some of you, the delays have almost been getting to you. I'm just here to encourage you with the words of the Apostle Paul. He said, even though I am surrounded and battered by trouble, I am not demoralized don't lie down on the inside don't allow your spirit to be demoralized keep on believing that's why paul says in philippians finally rejoice keep on rejoicing keep on believing keep on trusting in the goodness and in the mercy of god in the appointed time god will manifest his word in your life if you believe it this morning say amen come on and give jesus praise in the house hallelujah hallelujah come on God is faithful this morning, Pretoria. God is faithful, Bloemfontein. God is faithful, Johannesburg, George, wherever you are. God is faithful this morning. God is faithful and God loves you. God cares about you. In Jesus' name, we worship you. Just lift your hands to Him a little bit. Just lift your hands to Him. Wherever you are, just lift your hands to Him. We just worship you today, Father. Whatever it is, whatever the care, whatever the trial, whatever the concern, just bring all those things to Jesus as we sing this one song, as we cast our cares upon Him this morning. Whatever it is, maybe you've done it before, but you've taken them back. Come this morning and give it to Jesus once and for all.